unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. You're the light unto my path. Hello and welcome to Sound Words. Sound Words is the theme that has been selected as a course of study for the Church Street Church of Christ this year. It is based upon some words that Paul writes to Timothy. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, to which I was appointed a preacher an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8, 11, and 13. In keeping with this theme, then, of sound words, this program is simply a Bible study. How better to discern sound words than to listen to the Word Himself, Jesus the Christ? So we are using this weekly time slot to simply study the Bible together. We are studying the Gospel of John. I hope that you will continue to tune in at this time each week to participate in this fascinating study. I hope you have your Bible ready so that you can follow along and possibly even take notes along the way so that you can prepare yourself for even deeper study on a personal level. As we continue our study today, I want to begin by simply reminding us of the word pictures for Jesus that we have already seen in John's Gospel. We saw that in chapter 1, Jesus is the Son of God because John is focusing on his deity. We saw in chapter 2 where Jesus is the Son of Man because John switches his focus from the deity of Jesus to the humanity of Jesus. We saw in John chapter 3 that Jesus is the divine teacher because of the time that he spends discussing the scriptures with Nicodemus by night. And we saw in John chapter 4 where Jesus is the soul winner because of his encounter with a woman at the well in Samaria. So as we review these word pictures, they are reminders to us of where we have already been. And I want to remind you that we are in a section of John's Gospel now where Jesus is going to have three consecutive encounters, three consecutive interviews with individuals. We've already seen his connection with Nicodemus. He is also going to interview the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 and a nobleman of Capernaum in John chapter 4 as well. So for sake of review and to keep the context in play as we've been studying John's gospel, I want to take you back to John chapter 2 and remind us of the last verses there in John chapter 2 verses 23 and following. It's fascinating because when we remember the big picture that John is writing to establish belief or to reestablish belief in his readers or hearers, we read in John chapter 2 verse 23, now when he, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, 
during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Now, this verse shouldn't surprise us, but it should simply remind us that John is working toward demonstrating signs of Jesus that will lead people to believe. So it appears in verse 23 that that purpose is being accomplished because he says when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, there are many people who had seen the signs which he did and as a result believed. But then John adds this little caveat in verses 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So even though John says there are people who have seen the signs that Jesus performs and those signs are leading them to belief, he quickly adds this little statement that Jesus also knows the hearts of men and because he knows and sees things that others cannot, he knows that this belief is not the level of belief that he desires. It is simply belief based upon a physical sign. He's hoping that that sign will lead a person to not only believe in the miraculous event, but also to believe in the one who worked that miraculous event, pointing him not only to Jesus the Christ, but also to God the Father. And so as John sets the tone with this little discrepancy here between belief and the hearts of men, we see that because Jesus knows the human heart thoroughly, the reader of John's gospel is going to be allowed to observe his method of dealing skillfully with three different types of personality with the purpose of bringing them to belief. So we're going to see the interview with Nicodemus, the interview with the woman at the well in Samaria, and the interview with the noble nobleman of Capernaum, and I want us again to remember that all three of these interviews are working toward the same purpose, but John is showing us Jesus' connection to various strata of society. We saw first Jesus talking to Nicodemus by night. Now, Nicodemus, we saw, was a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night, and there is always great discussion of why Nicodemus may have chosen nighttime to come to Jesus. Is he coming stealthily, trying to not be discovered by his peers? Is he coming at night because he hopes to be uninterrupted? There are a number of reasons why this encounter may have taken place at night, but needless to say, it appears that Nicodemus is very genuine in his questioning of Jesus. We know that as a Pharisee, he must be zealous for the law, and he's very scrupulous in his observance of it, and Nicodemus acknowledges Jesus right from the get-go as a teacher who has come from God. So this declaration is not only a polite concession, but also demonstrates an initial step, at least, of his faith. Jesus immediately jumps into talking about new birth and asserts that without a complete change that is comparable only to being born again, the natural man cannot possibly hope to enter a spiritual kingdom. And so that begins their discussion, differentiating between the natural and the spiritual person. Jesus wants Nicodemus and others to see that there must be a change that takes place from the natural person to become a spiritual person. And as he's trying to describe this or explain it to Nicodemus, Jesus approaches the discussion from the standpoint of the Jewish scriptures because he knows that as a leader of the Jews, Nicodemus is very familiar with the scriptures. So Jesus takes him back, as we've discussed, to Numbers chapter 21 and retells the story, in a sense, of Moses' erecting a standard or a pole with a bronze serpent at the top of it to heal people from poisonous snake bites. He makes an analogy of that event to the actual cross. The word translated here, lifted up, is used to describe Jesus being lifted up on the cross as a sacrifice for mankind, and it is only used in the Gospel of John to describe the event of the crucifixion. So it is intended to be an obvious analogy between the bronze serpent on the pole 
and Jesus hanging on the cross. God's positive purpose in Christ is simply the salvation of the unbeliever. That's the point that Jesus wants Nicodemus to see. He wants him to understand that salvation is not restricted, but it's available to anyone who truly obeys, anyone who truly believes. If they do not believe, if they refuse to believe, then judgment is the logical consequence of that unbelief. So then we turn to John chapter 4, and we talked a little bit about geography. We saw this statement in chapter 4, verse 4, where it says Jesus needed to go through Samaria when he was traveling from Judea to Galilee. And we talked about the fact that most Jews would not travel through Samaria, that they would add time and distance to their journey by going around Samaria. So the wording here is very interesting when Jesus needs to go, or in some translations say, must go through Samaria. Jesus' reason for passing through Samaria is not a geographical necessity, and it's not even because of social pressure, but there appears to be this underlying compulsion of the divine will that seeks out lost Samaritan sheep. And so that sets up Jesus' second encounter, The word picture, again, for John chapter 4 is the soul winner, primarily because of the way he interacts with this woman at the well. So I'd like for us to turn together to John chapter 4 and read the text, starting at verse 5. Now, this is a longer text, but I think it's important for us to see all of it together before we begin to discuss it. So let's start with John chapter 4, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither at this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, all the disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. 
Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So as you can see, not only is this a lengthy passage we've just read together, but there is quite a lot going on in this passage. I want you to notice, first of all, as Jesus deals with the woman at the well, he begins with certain appeals to her. He knows that the surest way to win a friendship is simply to ask a favor, and that's what he does. That's the technique that he uses to open up the conversation with her. You can look back to John chapter 4, verse 7, and we read, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now, as we've already established the idea that this is a Jew talking to a Samaritan and a man talking to a woman, both of which would have been a surprise in this culture, the woman is going to be taken aback by Jesus' request for this favor. Jesus is going to appeal also to her curiosity in verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This seems like a really strange thing for someone to say. As a matter of fact, the woman is going to respond by saying, You don't have anything to draw with, and this well is very deep. How in the world are you going to give me water? Now Jesus is wanting to arouse her curiosity by talking about living water because he's really not talking about this physical well and he's really not talking about physical water. So to ensure more than just casual questions, Jesus also wants to move her to the next level and appeal to her desire. Look at verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. Now he wants to find out, is this woman more than just curious? Does she have a desire to know more? Does she want to learn how to achieve this living water that Jesus is offering? So upon her expression of genuine desire that follows, Jesus now is going to lead and appeal to her ambition. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. He knows that this is going to be a difficult challenge for her. And she's going to balk just a little bit because she says, I have no husband. She's not sure if she wants to commit to the level that Jesus is asking her to commit. So while she is struggling with the emotions of desire, but also withdrawal, Jesus unmasks her completely by appealing to her moral sense. Look at the latter part of verse 17 when he says, You have well said, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. So Jesus is now unmasking her, wanting to appeal to her moral sense, letting her know that he knows something about her personal life. And when she tries to divert attention or change the subject, Jesus appeals to her religious sensibilities. And that's the conversation that begins in verse 21, when Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus now takes this to a religious level of conversation when she begins to ask him about worship. He's going to be challenging her personal faith in verse 26 when he says to her, after she has said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. In verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So we notice these appeals that Jesus is making all through the conversation. He wants to win her friendship first by asking a favor. He's going to appeal then to her curiosity. He's going to then move on to her desire. He wants to see what kind of ambition she has. Then he moves from her desire when she starts to show a little bit of hesitancy. He then appeals to her morality. He starts to talk with her about religious ideas and sensibilities and then he makes it very personal when he challenges her faith. So when you evaluate this conversation as a whole, you see that Jesus is really laying a pattern even for us today that can be used in soul winning. Remember, our word picture for Jesus in John chapter 4 is the soul winner, and he gives us this beautiful strategy for dealing with someone who's very different than ourselves, someone who has a completely different background, and Jesus simply starts where she is. It's interesting to me that when you look at this scene, this woman comes to the well in the middle of the day likely because she is an outcast, likely because she thinks she can come to the well in the middle of the day and not be interrupted or have an encounter with anyone. And yet here is this man, here is this Jew, who not only has a polite conversation with her, who not only asks her a favor, but one who starts to talk about things she's never heard before, arousing her curiosity, causing her to ask some questions, causing her to feel a little bit uncomfortable as he probes deeper and deeper into her personal life. But ultimately, she goes and tells everyone in town about what she has experienced. Now, remember, this is a woman who is an outcast, and yet she has had such an encounter with Jesus. Jesus that is so transforming or at least so exciting to her that she wants to tell others. And the others, the townspeople, come out and they listen to Jesus themselves and ultimately they're going to draw the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah, not simply because this woman has said so, but because they've heard him for themselves and drawn their own conclusion. It's also fascinating when you look at this account in John chapter 4 to notice how this woman's view of Jesus changes throughout the conversation. Her estimate of him continues to improve. If you notice in verse 9, when she first has an encounter and the conversation is in its infancy, so to speak, she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? So she sees Jesus simply as a Jew. But by the time you get to verse 12, she asks this question. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? So now she has moved in her estimate of Jesus from him simply being a Jew to one who possibly is greater than Jacob. Then if you drop on down to verse 19, she makes this statement, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So now she has moved from Jew to one who may be greater than Jacob to a prophet, and then ultimately she's going to draw an even bigger conclusion by the time we get to verse 29. And in verse 29, she says to the townspeople, Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So notice her rising estimate of Jesus moves from Jew to greater than Jacob to prophet to Messiah. And then because of her testimony, the response of the Samaritans is an example how this type of reaction follows a personal investigation of Jesus. They go out to see Jesus because of curiosity, just like the woman herself had had. But once they hear him for themselves, they develop a personal view. They develop a personal level of commitment based upon their own investigation of Jesus. So there are many tips here that are important for us to not only read historically, but to see how this account is showing us some great ways to do personal evangelism to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. 
So again, as we look back over where we've been in chapters 1 through 4 of John's Gospel, we see Jesus as the Son of God. He is deity, chapter 1. We see Jesus as the Son of Man. He is humanity, chapter 2. We see Jesus as the divine teacher having a deep conversation about religious matters with one of the religious leaders of the Jews, Nicodemus, by night. And now we have moved to chapter 4, where we see Jesus as a soul winner because of the interest that he's taken in this woman who is very different from himself. He is a Jew. She is a Samaritan, he is a man, she is a woman, and even when Jesus' disciples come back after having been departed for a while looking for something to eat for lunch, when they come back, they are stunned. They're wondering why in the world would Jesus be talking to this woman? And it's interesting because that is the same response the woman herself had. Why would this man, who is a Jew, be talking to me, who is a Samaritan woman? Because we all know that Jews want nothing to do with Samaritans. We know that Jews go around Samaria when traveling from Galilee to Judea or from Judea to Galilee. But this man felt some sort of divine compulsion to not go around Samaria, but to go through Samaria. And by going through Samaria then, this soul winner... Jesus the Christ has an encounter that changes a woman's life. And as it changes her life, she goes and tells the story to the townspeople, no longer feeling like an outcast, wanting to share with them what she has learned. They come out out of curiosity to investigate Jesus for themselves, and they find out rather quickly that Jesus is everything this woman claimed to be, and they reach their own conclusions because of their own personal investigation. It's a fascinating story when you see how all the pieces are woven together by John as he tries to teach his readers that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We're out of time for today. I hope that you'll be with me again next week. You have been listening to Sound Words, a presentation of the Church Street Church of Christ in Lewisburg, Tennessee. I am Kyle Bolton, the pulpit minister at Church Street, and I would like to personally invite you to come and share times of Bible study and worship with us each week. We meet every Sunday at 9 o'clock a.m. for our morning worship, followed by our Sunday school for all ages at 10.15 a.m. Then we meet again at 6 o'clock p.m. for our evening worship. We also have a midweek meeting for devotion and Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Holy words, long preserved. For our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world where. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Holy words. Of our faith handed down to this age came to us through sacrifice. Oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true. Changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. 
Or let the ancient words impart Ancient words ever true Changing me and changing you We have come with open hearts Oh, let the ancient words impart We have come with open hearts Oh, let the 